This podcast is brought to you by Steed Motor Group, Clare Galway. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, find out more at steedmotorgroup.ie. So delighted now to be joined by Michael Verney of the Irish Independent to look ahead to the Club All-Ireland semi-final between St. Thomas's and Ballygunner at half seven on Saturday evening in Port Leash. Michael, thanks very much uh, for coming on. But before we get into it, I was talking to Kenneth Burke last week and I was referencing the point of the time of this game, uh, the day. When you're playing yourself, I imagine you can't really get a worse time than this really for an All-Ireland semi-final, can you? Uh, the only thing that'd be worse if it was Sunday evening at half seven. But uh, Saturday, like to be honest with you, I'd be... I'd be up in arms over the fact that they're playing an all Ireland semi-final. You're guaranteed you're starting and finishing under lights when there's no real need for that. It's a different story if it's playing in Crow Park, maybe and maybe the second semi-final last year, the lights maybe were turned on towards the end of Ballyhale and Ballygunner, both playing in Crow Park. But for a game to start, a game of this magnitude, to start under lights and finish under lights is absolutely bananas. When it just it doesn't seem like there's a need for that to be the case. Um and it's obviously like for players and management, it's a it's a tricky one. For supporters, it's a very very tricky one. Particularly, like we've a, we've a six month old here, and I can imagine if she was, if we were bringing her to the game, like what do you do there? The game's over at nine o'clock. You're back home at what twelve o'clock. You're trying to get like it's a disaster. The whole logistics of it are a nightmare for I'd imagine everyone involved. But um, listen, the winner the winners won't care. But it just seems like another unnecessary move. It do, it doesn't really make sense. The one on Sunday is at a grand time for everybody. You'd imagine they would have tried to play the two of them as a double header, or at least play one at half one and the other one maybe thrown in a three. And if lights have to come on for the second half, then so be it. But I definitely wouldn't be happy with number one playing under lights and number two. It's just different playing in the evening time. There's the there's a dew on the on the surface that makes it completely different than if you're thrown in at two o'clock in the day. Completely different type of ball. Listen, it probably does favour a back. It probably would have suited me maybe a bit more back in the day, but no, I, I would never would have, never would have fancied playing a game of this magnitude under lights, and I, I don't think it's right personally. Yeah, I don't think both these uh, two teams are that used to playing um, under lights as well. But particularly for players, even if you're a younger player. <laughs> It'll be very hard for these players not to be thinking about anything other than the game all day, really. Yeah, um, like we'd often have club fixtures back in Offaly there where you're playing at six o'clock on a Sunday evening, and the whole weekend has got the whole weekend has gone by, and your last on or whatever half seven on a Saturday evening. Yeah, I there's probably going to be a decent bit of travel involved for both, and they'd stop somewhere. They'd probably be on the road around two or three o'clock. They'd stop somewhere kick the feet up for half an hour, chill out a bit, get some food. Um, but yeah, it's a long, it's a long time to be thinking about. Like, don't get me wrong, from a spectator's point of view, you like if you're not working at the game or you're not attending the game, like sure, most people are sitting up with their feet in front of the fire. It's brilliant, it's brilliant, but mm -hmm. that's not really who you should be thinking of. You should be thinking of the guys that are on the pitch and the management teams involved. So yeah, particularly for younger players, it's say we there's a potential to be overthinking about different things that would be going on or potential scenarios because there's there's so much time to think and it's a bit unusual. It's totally out of norm. Like I wonder, like I wonder really if you go back through it, like Bally Gunner have played, you know, maybe some maybe second half of the Pierce game under lights. Yeah. Uh, definitely last year. Not sure about this year. Maybe a bit, but like I can't imagine when the last time Thomas has played under lights. Maybe the lights were turned on in the Gaelic grounds when they play Boris Lee in the all Ireland Club semi-final, maybe. But like it's um it's something completely new for them. And this is a, this is I suppose where prep during the year where you, this is why you can't just play all your games on a Sunday at two o'clock, even challenge games. You have to go and play a challenge game on a Wednesday night under lights. Maybe you go and play a challenge game on a Friday night under lights. And it, hopefully you're thinking you might get the percents and have the percents in the bank when something mad like this is thrown up a kind of a crazy kind of scenario. It's still a game here, Bally Gunner and Thomas's Bally Gunner obviously going into this one as raging up favourites. Uh, last week when I looked at the odds, Thomas's were nine to two to win this game, which is mental when you think about it. But it's a it's a really good game to look forward to, isn't it? Ah, uh, it's a cracking game to look forward to. You, like you're looking at two teams that have been in around this 
you know, scenario or situation for a hell of a long time now. Thomas is it's ten years obviously since, since since their first county title and their first kind of All Ireland series. Uh, they were beaten in semi final last year, probably surprisingly. Haven't been back in the final, I don't think, since that kind of uh, not so not such a nice day against Ballyhale and Patrick's Day a couple of couple of years ago. Um, Bally Gunner are see, so seasoned at this level. Um, I think Bally Gunner are just such raging half favourites because just no matter what it seems you throw at them, they just seem to have the answers and they seem to have the answers very quickly within a game. They could be under pressure 10 or 15 minutes into a game. All of a sudden, Philip Matney's back in front of Barry Coughlin. Everything's tightened up. The half forwards are back to pitch. The middle third is clogged up. Daisy Hutchinson has 50 or 60 yards of space in front of him and they can go to town on you. Like If you look at the start of the Munster final, Clonara got a brilliant start. Couldn't have asked for a better start. A couple of points on the board and you're thinking, this is the perfect start for an underdog team. 15 minutes later, you're realistically thinking the game is probably over and that's how quick they can do it. And even if you look at John Conlon's shot drop short in the, the Munster final, ball doesn't go dead. 20 seconds later, the ball is in the net at the far end. Like the sickener of a ball dropping short to the double sickener of a ball ended up in the, in the net at the far end. Um, but I would still have a sneaking suspicion like the last time Thomases were really, really hurting going into a game, I would say it was the Bally Hale game a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And look at that performance they delivered. That was a near perfect performance. And it took a piece of absolute genius from TJ Reid to deny them that they were like they were the better team on the day. There's no point in saying any different. They're a better team for about 60, 62, 63 minutes. It was just a bit of genius at the end. And they're carrying the heart of the Dunlai game into this game. But they're they're coming up against it's funny though. Bally, like everyone's given out about Bally Gunner and their dominance or whatever. Bally Gunner and Thomas have the same amount of all Ireland titles. But everyone is, you know, putting the, the Tommy Moore is going back to Bally Gunner already this year. I, I don't think they're vulnerable to underperforming, but Thomas's are going to have to bring something. They're going to have to bring something like that Bally Hale performance a couple of years ago if they're to be in my shout. Yeah, I mean, isn't it somewhat I think Thomas's are being a bit disrespected this weekend? Obviously, Bally Gunner are a very good team, but this is the first time Kenneth Burke goes into an All Ireland semi final with a full team. Yeah, very true. Um, they were obviously seriously hamstrung before last year's semi final, and even just in the warm up, uh, wasn't a Dara Burke that, that pulled up in the yeah. warm up. Um, they were they were under pressure. They were missing, they were missing Shane Cooney for the previous All Ireland semi final, weren't they? Against Bally Hale, he did the crucial a couple of weeks beforehand. So it was only just looking at that. They definitely have a healthier squad and a squad with a lot more depth to choose from, and. I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but something I said on a podcast a couple of years ago was, was used as, as motivation for Thomas's to win, I think, their fourth county title, even though what I said was kind of cut off mid-sentence. They, they will take any, whether it's the odds or whether it's pundits or whatever, they will take any bit of disrespect, I'm sure, and harness that. But they are going to need to harness every bit of it. It's fascinating, really. You look at the inside line of Ballygunner, Patrick Fitzgerald, obviously, and Desi Hutchinson have been unbelievable this year. But this Thomas's full back line of David Cherry, Finton Burke, and Keane Mahoney conceded one goal throughout the championship. They're a mean, mean full back line. They are a mean full back line. Just something I was thinking about before I came on. There's not an obvious matchup for Finton Burke in the full back line because you'd say Desi Hutchinson and Patrick Fitzgerald are two. Um, kind of nippy, very, very quick forwards that are generally picked up by, they might be picked up by a fullback in the case of if it's a Mike Casey, someone who's really strong but really mobile and a similar kind of height profile. Like I'd say, like, well, what would Finton Burke have on Desi or Patrick Fitzgerald? Could have 15 to 20 kg maybe, 10 or 15 definitely anyway. And that's fine if you're coming up against you know, a six foot two, 14 stone full forward and like Finton Burke matches up absolutely perfect and he was outstanding in the county final. But I'm intrigued to see what their what that matchup will be because I don't know if a, what if Desi Hutchinson one on one in fifty or sixty yards of space on Finton Burke is the matchup that Thomas has won. So maybe 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 I'll be proven wrong and they will put him on, they will put have him picking up either Patrick Patrick Fitzgerald or Desi, but maybe there might be a different job for him. Um and that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, what do you do there? Because like quite often Bally Gunner will play with this two man in type of forward line, other forwards will drift out and it's not in the Shane Cooney will sit at different stages, but it's not in Thomas's DNA to play a sweeper all the time. Yeah, very, very tricky one. Um 
And like I'm talking there that maybe Fintan won't pick up either of the two lads, but you know, you know, I wouldn't see him playing sweeper or anything either. It, that's not his role. He's to me like he's man on he's a man on man, like but, but like he's man on man for someone like Rod Hegarty, maybe. Not for I don't know if the pro if the size profile necessarily will suit him. Um the two cornerbacks you mentioned, Sherry and Mahoney, are probably physically maybe better better equipped to, to pick up the two lads because it's all pace it's all kind of agility over five or ten yards that's not to say Finton is slow far from it he definitely isn't but I, I just I, I think that's going to be interesting to see how it's deployed like will Kenneth Burke want a situation where it's one-on-one -on -one with 60 yards of space and that lovely ball coming in like the most sympathetic ball to a forward you will ever see like it's never 50-50 it's never 60-40 it's 90-10 in favour of the forward will that suit um, Fintan Burke if he's in that scenario probably not will they would they potentially deploy him out in the half back line see you're you're, um, you're looking at making a move that hasn't kind of been made at this stage before they, they, they've played him in the one position all year listen maybe maybe they'll go with uh, maybe they'll go with him inside but he's going to be playing a different type of Role and picking up a different type of player, like would he have come up against anyone like like Desi Hutchinson or Patrick Fitzgerald in the Galway Championship? I don't think he would have realistically. So fascinating to see how they deploy him and get the best out of him because getting the best out of him is crucial to Thomas's winning. When they when they nearly beat Bally Hale two years ago, like he was man of the match on on Colin Fenley the same day. He was absolutely outstanding. Um, and for them to win, he's going to have to have that nine out of ten at the back. Where they deploy him is just going to be the interesting thing, I reckon. Just when you're alluding to that, is it about Thomas is making this an ugly game? Uh, yeah, it's it's easier said than done because the similarities between Bally Gunner and Limerick are like they're glaring similarities, and it's no like it's no coincidence that the Shawnee O'Donnell, the stats man with Limerick, and by all accounts, the he's not even a stats man; he's a performance analysis, video analysis. He's obviously working between the best club team in the country and the best county team in the country. And it's all fine and well saying we're going to do this, this and this. But when you're out on the pitch, and I'd, I'd, love, to, I'd love to be out there even just for half an hour just to see how little space you have to operate. Like they're, they're so compact. It's so difficult to penetrate them, particularly at the back. You have, obviously, maybe they play two inside, maybe uh, Coughlin and Power maybe might play inside. Philip Matt, he's always there. He's always there as protection. The halfbacks are always sitting back. The midfielders are always sitting back. Paddy Levy's always that link man between the 45 and 65. The half forwards are always back out. Peter Hogan plays on his own 45 as much as he does in the attacking 45. And that, like, they pull them all back and they leave a heap of space inside for the two speedsters. So, what I said about Bally Hale there, and they probably did pretty dominate Bally Hale for a long time, Bally Hale would play a relatively traditional style compared to Bally Gunner, who you know, really play it through the lines. Like, look at that team goal they got against Clonara the last day. 10 or, 10 or 12 passes, just bang, 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 bang. And, you know, it's funny. They'll, they'll actually pass the ball when you think the pass, they shouldn't pass it. They, they, you think Desi got the ball in the last day and you're thinking, oh, he's 40 yards out here. He slings it over the bar. Handy score. No, they'll go for that extra pass. They'll go for the juggler. Um, and it's just going to be interesting. Like, tactically... Thomas's will not have come up against anything like what they're coming up against on Saturday night. And yeah, it's one thing to say it need, it does need to be ugly and they need to be like woeful. There needs to be woeful physicality, but there needs to be a fair uh, level of execution as well. And it needs to be really, really high level execution. They appear to brought the thunder against Bally Gunner, but their skill execution let them down like over and over and over again. If it, if, and that was a lot to do with the Bally Gunner pressure. So, Thomas is everything's going to have to be on point, and if they get a chance, they're just going to, like I don't know if they have to walk the ball past in in past Stephen O'Keefe. That's what they're going to have to do. <laughs> they might only get one or two chances, and he's just so good, and he makes spreads himself so wide. Like Thomas is going to need a goal or two to win this. They're going to need something like they're going to maybe need two fifteen, three fourteen, something like that. I think to win this game, and obviously that's a lot easier said than done against you know, probably top three keepers in the country and, you know, one of the best defences in the country as well, obviously. You mentioned Limerick there and similarities. Philip Manny is kind of similar to Declan Hannon in that role, but Shane Cooney's kind of the same for Thomas as this year he's been central. He's kind of really got back to himself and he, he does kind of similarly play that kind of Declan Hannon role that we see for Limerick. 
Yeah, that should having him available and fully fit is is a huge one, a huge one for Thomas. Is like getting a new player in, and interesting to see as well. Um, there's been a decent bit of time between the semi final and the county final. Like, what role does David Burke play here? He was, you know, he was getting a couple of minutes, but was he put? Were they pushing it to get a couple of minutes just to have him on the field? I, I wonder what's he been able to do. Very, very similar to say Willow Dunahoo in the Limerick final. He, you know, performed on the day. You know, been able, been ready four weeks time or five weeks time for against Baddy Gunner was a different story. Like, what role will he play? Will he play that impact sub? Like, if they bring him in with fifty minutes to go, it's potentially is that too late? Or could Baddy Gunner be coasting at that stage? Do you risk him from the start? So very, very interesting. Uh, you might know a bit more about who they've played up and down maybe the last three or four weeks or what challenge games or what whatever they've played. Um, you know what role he's going to play. But I think do you start him? All depends on whether he was a, he's been able to take pretty much a full part in the last since the county final. Like it was interesting to hear him talk after the county final. Like he they were, he was only on the field for about ten minutes, but they probably got away with it in a way because it was very very quick to be back. And would have done it. We even said the same after the Limerick final. Like that was his first game. Very very quick to be back. If he's taken most you know full part in most of the trends and has probably would have need to have played. I'd say a game and a half guts of that in the time since the county final. If he's done that, I think you kind of have to throw him in, really, don't you? Um, where where you throw him in is another story. Maybe he's the guy. Maybe he's the guy that plays that sitting role uh, potentially, um, and allows Shane Cooney to potentially follow Parik Mahoney and not allow him to dictate the game. Maybe David Burke played a started the All Ireland semi final last year centre back I think didn't he yeah. against yeah. against Dunloy and like his reading and positioning is top class he's not going to be fit to go box to box you'd imagine um so maybe potentially they'll deploy him in that type of a role yeah there has been something even when he's come on in these games he's like he came on against Turlock Moore he he came on in the semi final as well against Sarsfields but he's He's given the Thomas's supporter and the Thomas's player just a massive lift when he enters that field. Yeah, um, I suppose that's they were always going to be in the games in Galway. The question yeah. would be like he's not um to say he's not going to come on and score one two shall we say he's not that type of barrel and full forward that can come in and turn a game. He turns a game in a different type of way. Well, like if if you don't if you don't start him, I think potentially you're running the risk of been on the back foot bringing him on rather than in the last couple of games he's been coming on and it's been okay Davey Burke is coming on now we're just going to push it on here we, we're you know we're a couple of points up and we're going to push it on and he's given everyone a boost um, I tell you and a lot of it does come back to how much he has done in, in, the la- in the last couple of weeks but if he has enough done I'd probably be throwing him in from the start, being honest with you, because you know, you know, listen, I'm sure who knows more what they're going to get out of him than his brother, realistically. And I'm sure that's, I'm sure that was a conversation that was had, you know, in a, in a snug on a Monday or Tuesday night after the county final. Like, we need to have you in this position to play what's most likely going to be Bally Gunner. And I'm sure that's all he's been thinking of. Um, and he's been like, his recovery has been absolutely remarkable. And if he's to start now, I'll learn the semi final, it'd be even more remarkable if he's fit to do so. I'd probably be throwing him in from the start realistically. Interestingly, in the Thomas's attack, you've obviously seen Connor Cooney has been the standout forward in Galway Club Hurling the last five or six years. He's predominantly playing at 11, but he can find himself going in at uh, 14 as well. But something with this Thomas's forward unit, they don't necessarily all stay in the set positions. There's constant switches and the, the management are always good for kind of pulling the rabbit out the hat and they might throw someone that's been playing in the half in the full forward line. With Bally Gunner, how, how do you approach it there? Would, would you go with, say, a two-man full forward line? Would, would you go with three? How do you think Thomas's need to do that? It's funny when you talk about Thomas is throwing the rabbit out of the hat the odd time. It's the funny thing about Bally Gunner, it's the very same at Limerick. You know exactly who's going to play everywhere on the pitch, realistically. Um, what can Thomas is throw at Bally Gunner that they haven't uh, that hasn't maybe been thrown at them before? Like Barry Coughlin at, at fullback or even playing in that kind of he plays in that spoiler role and he's gonna try and spoil one of Thomas's best forwards. And imagine if Aina Burke plays inside, he'd probably try and spoil him. Um 
that like that's a that's a potential duel that Thomas's can't afford to afford to lose. Would you maybe like I don't know. I I think to beat Bally Gunner, and maybe I'm contradicting what I said earlier, but there has to be you're gonna have to beat them from outside a fair bit. You're gonna have to have shooters that can punish them from you know, ninety, a hundred yards maybe at times, because you know, if they know that you're going to try and keep playing that ball into it with say a two man inside line and it's in a work inside, Philip Matney's just going to sit back the whole time. Whereas if you if you're able to punish them from out the pitch, all of a sudden that draws Philip Matney out a small bit, and that means that they have to push out and they can't be beaten. From, they won't allow themselves to be beaten from out the pitch. All of a sudden, then when they're pushed out, that creates a potential opening for you know a good ball inside to an Aina Burke or whatever. Um, Victor Manzo, who's improved a good bit this year as well, um, an exciting enough player. But they're going they're gonna have to really mix it with them in di- in different ways. You can't just expect you're going to play two man two man full forward and they're going to get lo- loads of lovely ball in. That won't happen. In order for that to happen, they're probably going to have to score four or five points from the outside, draw Bally Gunner out, and then get the ball in, then get the ball inside. So it's going to have to be a lot of different points to their attack, and it's going to have to be like. You would say the two twelve that that won the county final just won't cut it at the weekend. I'd be very, I'd be very, very surprised if it did. We've alluded on quite a bit. Is Philip Mahoney the key to stop here for Thomas is to win? Yeah, to me, he's the man. Yeah, he's the fulcrum of everything, both defensively and offensively. Um, he's the defensive linchpin in that he's like a lot of the time you see Barry Coughlin running for a ball with his man and he's literally just spoiling he does not want to touch the ball he will just allow the ball to break and lo and behold like you're after waving a magic wand Philip Matney is just standing there with the ball in his hand and how many times have we seen their attack started by like, very, it's very very rare he strikes the ball more than 30 yards it's a lovely little dink pass out to someone and they're on the move like if you're trying to shut him down that probably means at times you maybe have to pay, play with seven attackers um, or somebody picking him up or somebody spoiling him. And in theory, that's fine. But the effects of that are found at the other end where there's way more space. If there's only if there's potentially an extra man up in attack, that means there's one less in defence and you're under a bit of pressure. So, But to me, no, stopping him and not making a hero of him is one of the keys to success. And I'm even thinking back to when Boris Lee beat him in the Munster final in 19... Like rather than like making a hero of him, they just pucked every ball. They actually pucked every ball down on top of him. Every puck out, nearly every puck out. But they got about fifteen or twenty bodies around it and just tried to spoil, just break ball, get the ball to ground, and we'll fight for it. And it actually worked quite well. And I think it was something Bally Gunner weren't really ready for. Um, something I should have mentioned as well is that Bally Gunner have changed their point of attack a bit as well. Like seen at different stages this year. Yeah, they play through the lines and they give lovely ball inside. There's, they have no issue with that real pig ignorant ball into the edge of the square now and they've gotten scores from it. People would think it maybe it's old school or whatever, but if used at the right time, it's very, very effective. Like if you look at even Desi's goal against Clonara, what was that? That was a long high ball into the edge of the square from Patrick Fitzgerald and they were able to reap dividends from it. So I actually think Bally Gunner have, that was one of their maybe Achilles heel and They've worked on it a lot and they're able to, like when they see, if they see Thomas is pressed, O'Keefe will put snow on it and they try and put it down on the opposite D. Um, and that's what's so good about them, that they're able to vary what they do so well too. And Thomas's are going to have to vary what they do because, you know, a plan A won't work here. A plan B, C and D probably won't work here. It's You're going to have to dip into oh, a, a load of things at different times in the game. It's the biggest um, tread, as we've been alluding to, with Bally, Bally Gunner. If Thomas is due, fully pressed, which you imagine they have to do, and not give them space. If Bally Gunner get it out of that press, and even within a short five-minute period, this Bally Gunner team can just do serious damage. Yeah, they're the first club team I've ever seen to score three points within one minute in a match. Like, that's... That'll just kind of show you where modern hurling is going. But I remember covering one of their games last year. Well, it happened this year as well. That's how quickly it can happen. And there ha- they'll have to be they'll have to be a bit of cuteness um, from a Thomas's point of view. Whether it's something whether, whether George Kelly needs to do something Nicky Quaid esque at different times during the game, but they will get a run on you. And you know you think of a normal purple patch is like ten or fifteen minutes in a game. Bally Gunner can gut you in five minutes, as you said there. Um, and they're going to have to be very, very smart because it, that's all it takes. 
it literally you could be you could be going really well with them. It could be six points apiece after fifteen minutes, and then all of a sudden they've won two banged within two minutes, and you're after thinking, "Geez, we had a great first quarter there, but the game has changed completely." And they get a run on you, and it's fascinating with the press. I thought it was really interesting against against Napiershig. Napiershig pressed them as well as I've seen any team press them uh, in recent years. But as I said, said earlier, they couldn't execute you know as well as they'd like. But when Bally Gunner did break the press. It was like it was like a rugby team attacking. It was like, like a wave of players running up the pitch. And they can sense as well when that killer score is on. They know, like, they knew the last day that, you know, if we're able to get another goal or an opportunity presents itself against Clonara, we're going for the throat here and we are not stopping. And they would do the same against Thomas's uh, if that chance arises. Listen, there's probably going to have to be it's not in in club level, but there's probably going to have to be a few kind of cynical tackles at different stages. That's it. The rules, the rules actually reward you at the minute. So, like, if Bally Gunner break a line, someone's going to have to take a yellow uh, and maybe haul a fella down. That's just going to have to be. That's going to be the way because if Bally Gunner get a goal, you're kind of thinking if Bally Gunner get a goal at any stage, particularly in the first half, Thomas is going to be under big pressure. I get the sense from. Uh... You talk about Bally Gunners threats at, at different stages here. You expect them um to defeat Thomas's this weekend, but does the winner of the All Ireland come from this game no matter what for you, or do you still think there's potential on the other side to Um uh, like I think if Bally Gunner win, they win the All Ireland. Um if Thomas's win, it's far from a foregone conclusion. I think well, I think Cushendall will will give O'Loughlin's plenty to think about, but O'Loughlin's have overcome some huge obstacles already this year. They've taken down Bally Hale, chasing six and all in the Kilkenny final, winning a game the last day in the Leinster final where they were probably not the better team for the vast majority, but still managed to get over line through Paddy Deegan's heroics. Um, if Bally Gunner win, the uh, the All Ireland winner comes from this side. If Thomas's win. Oh, like that's a puck of a ball between them and O'Loughlin's. Be honest, it'd be a cracking final. Like it's kind of similar to. Like there's a lot of if you take Bally Gunner out of it, you probably throw a blanket over a lot of the rest of the teams. But you're not, you're not, you're not taking Bally Gunner out of it. Um, I, I, yeah, I think Bally Gunner will win at the weekend. Um, I think it'll probably be something like six or seven in the end, but it could be very, very tight the whole way through. Um, like ah, oh, just, just so many ways to hurt you with. With uh, with Peter Hogan on the wing, with Parik Mahoney, um, like he can't be allowed to dictate. Like he's been outstanding in their la- in their last couple of games. But they have a different fella that can pop up every day, and that's the real killer. You could you could keep Desi quiet, and you could keep Parik Mahoney quiet, and it's just Peter Hogan ends up man of the match, or Patrick Searles ends up man of the match, or yeah, Mikey Mahoney ends up man of the match, or Kevin Mahoney. Like Jesus, when you go down through it, um, they have some riches to pick from. Something that I I will say. Is last year, and I don't know if it was a tactic because I was never chatting anyone from Ballyhale after. But Paddy Levy's crucial for Bally Gunner, but every time he gets the ball, he brick flicks the ball away to somebody else. So his game is not necessarily striking a ball. That's not what his strong point is. But what I noticed with Ballyhale last year is that when Paddy Levy got the ball, rather than pressing him and putting pressure on him, they actually moved away from him and they picked up everybody else that was around. So they made sure that everyone else was tagged. They actually allowed him to hit the ball. And I distinctly remember him hitting like one bad wide in the second half that was demoralizing when they were chasing the game and delivering a couple of balls in that wouldn't be the sort of ball that the Bally Gunner lads would be used to. So I'm just wondering, is that something that maybe Thomas's will look at? You know, the immediate reaction, and it's a panic almost when someone gets the ball, oh, press up on him, press up on him and try and take the ball off him. But Levy will, if you press up on him, he just flick the ball out to somebody with due respect who is probably a better ball player and it will deliver a better ball inside. So I just wonder, is that something? They're all little inches that Thomas is going to have to look at and they're going to have to, like, when you look at, we mentioned Philip Matney, we mentioned maybe not making a hero out of Stephen O'Keefe as well. Like, you have to have the ball, the ball has to go 30 yards over the bar for Stephen O'Keefe not to take it down. Like, he's just so good and the ball has to be walked in past him for it to hit the net. But Thomas can't make a hero out of, we'll say, the top three or four players in Bally Gunner, as in Stephen O'Keefe, Philip Manny, I'd be having a look at Paddy Levy as well, and I wouldn't be allowing him to do what he wants to do. If if he strikes the ball, that's not what he wants to do. So make him do it. Um, and same with probably maybe Parik Manny as well. I, I, 
of all the forwards, I'd probably be tagging him and making sure that someone follows him around the pitch so that he's not allowed. Like he was savage defensively last day for Bally Gunner, probably his best defensive performance of all time. And he just can't be allowed to do that in defensive role. He can't be allowed to do that in a defensive role as well. But like when you look at it, Bally Gunner, it's the same as Limerick play most teams. Bally Gunner are going to do what they always do. And Thomas's are the ones really with all the questions and headaches this week. Um, that's what happens when you're playing the, you know, the best club team in the country. Yeah, someone that we didn't mention that Thomas's didn't have last year is James Regan. And he's absolutely crucial to their system. He's, he's probably their most underrated player if you ever just see Thomas's and see the work he does. But to be honest, I'm going to put my neck on the line here now this week. Um, I think a lot of people haven't seen the best to this Thomas's team. They're hurting from last year. And I just think there's one one more big step in them. And uh, I think they're going to shock Bally Gunner this weekend. Now, it could come back to could come back to bite me, but I just think there's something in this Thomas's team um, that a lot of people haven't seen. And even some of their forwards this year have been phenomenal. Aina Burke, Ushin Flannery, Victor Manzo, there's, there's a serious threat there. And I just think there's one last um, kick in them. And they're, I think they're going to be hurting here because even when I was talking to Kenneth Burke, he's, I said, do you reference Dunloy? And he said, yeah, we have references. We're, we're extremely disappointed last year. Like we, we totally underperformed. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you. And they're going to need... The, hurt will get you so far, is yeah. the one thing I will say. That hurt and that kind of drive, and it, you nearly got them over line against Ballyhale a couple of years ago. They'll need that. They'll need the blood and thunder and all of that. And they'll need massive turnovers and massive hits. But they'll also need... Like, if they get two goal chances, they have to take the two of them. You know, they can't... They can't hit double figures in wides. Do you know what I mean? It, it's going to have to be... It's going to have to be a very, very polished performance. And it's probably, it's quite, maybe you'd say Bally Gunner are probably going to have to underperform a small bit. I definitely see a big performance in them. I definitely see a big performance in them. Um, I just can't see it been enough. Um, and to be fair, you're, you're saying Thomas is win. You can say you're putting your head on the block, but when you're back in, when you're back in the underdog, like they're underdogs for a reason like do you know yeah. what I mean so like you've obviously seen enough in the club championship to think that they can do it there's definitely raw materials there and there's definitely a lot more things I'd say going right this year going into the semi-final than maybe last year but I just don't think I don't, I don't think they've come up against anything like this machine before and I'd be very surprised if if they're able to derail it yeah look it's gonna it's gonna be a cracker at half seven uh, on Saturday um Michael just on another thing Go obviously played Cork at the weekend in the Teddy McCarthy Memorial. Uh, they came up short, but it was interesting to hear Henry Shefflin after the game. It's kind of a perfect game to get really in December, isn't it? When you're kind of <laughs> all the players, they won't say it openly, but like I can imagine from your own experience as well, it's a ter- it's a terrible time around this year to be slogging in the hard training and, and to get to go down to Cork and, and play in a surface like Porky Cleave. No, it was ideal and like it was a like it was a challenge game, obviously, but like it was being streamed and there's plenty of eyes on them. So they had to come with a bit of a performance. The jersey is outstanding as well. It's one of the nicest it's one of the nicest jerseys I've seen in a long, long time. It's absolutely gorgeous. Very like the very like the Wexford away jersey, Navy one. Very, very, very tasty. That was one of my main takeaways, <laughs> from it, I can tell you. Um, but like that sort of that sort of game is probably invaluable at this time of the year. And going to help Henry with regards to trimming squads and stuff like that and getting a good look at lads against you know what it was a pretty strong Cork outfit yeah. on paper you know like fairness like they were obviously honouring one of their most famous uh, servants so they wanted to put a good team and uh, no it was a good test good test to get definitely and uh, yeah like you don't get that type of surface anywhere in the country bar Crow Park at this time of the year so I'd imagine from a player's point of view and even a management point of view it's all grand doing those, you know, doing your um, repetitive kind of speed endurance runs or whatever at this time of the year. But it's a different story um, when you actually go out and you have to execute skills with plenty of plenty of eyes on you. So I'm sure they took it pretty seriously, and it was something that they were. It was probably something they had marked in the calendar from when they when they went back that we want to be in a certain position um, and have a certain amount done before this game is played. But yeah, a, a great test to get at this time of the year. Yeah, a lot of new faces there. They were impressed for Goy uh, throughout the club championship and getting their chance and then some other players on an extended break as well, which is well-deserved after a long year. But 
But you, Michael, where do you feel Go Ireland's at at the minute? Um, so if you if you go by the first thirty minutes against Limerick last year, you're thinking they're in a in a pretty good in a pretty good position. If you go by the the second half, like that was a that was a no show second half the last day, and, you, and Limerick turned it on, and I've no issue with that as well. But the resistance or lack of resistance from Galway was very very worrying. I think within Henry's first two years, I think I don't know if he would have said it privately or whatever, but. He would have thought that he has to has have significant silverware on the board, and obviously, the the closing moments of that Leinster final where they had the Bob O'Keefe in their hands, or did you know, did a did a hand and four fingers on it, and then they let it go, and it was that was a that was a real killer, and they regrouped well and beat beat Tipperary in the quarter final, you know, a Tipperary side who. The wheel, it looked like the wheels had come off a small bit from the Waterford game onwards. You know, they, they beat me on awfully well in the qualifiers, hammered them, but you know, that was that was I think that was a bit of a non event as well. So, did but what they delivered in the first 30 minutes against 30 minutes against Limerick was outstanding stuff. It's just yeah. been able to actually sustain that over an hour. Um, I think like key takeaways for the year, like Connor Whelan probably took his form to. Another, another level but they just need to get like and Kevin Cooney I would say was one of the best like he was nominated for an all-star this year having not played much county before this as well they probably need to unearth a couple more I would say Galway have a hell of a lot of guys at a very similar level but maybe just a level below where where they, where they need to be like a lot of it is a kind of movable interchangeable feast with Galway Different certain players are in and certain players are out and new lads are coming in, but they're kind of similar type of players and at a similar level. Um, like Henry's obviously committed kind of long term to Galway. So, like, what do they need out of twenty twenty four? Like that, like they they need a title, be it the league or be it uh, a Leinster title. And they're going to realistically, they're going to be in around the last. They're definitely going to be in the last six. You wouldn't see them outside the top two in Leinster, so they're going to be in around the last six and going to be there. We're going to have to need, we're going to have to see something different. Whether that's a I don't know whether that's a, a Jamie Ryan or someone like that who's impressed who's impressed at club level, but you, you can't go with this, you can't keep going with the same faces and getting the same results. You're going to have to see a couple of new faces and give them their chance and see where it takes them. Yeah, a lot of people I've had on the podcast just assessing the year since. A lot of people have talked about 2024 and they've just said it's vital. The first thing go away you need to think about is winning the Leinster title in 2024. Yeah, um, I would have said it was the, definitely the same in in twenty twenty three as well, and they were they were nearly there. Um, it just obviously gives you a route straight to an All Ireland semi final as well. Um, it doesn't mean means you're you're avoiding playing anyone from Munster or like that in a quarter final. Like you would imagine to be big departure to say that they won't be in the top two in Leinster. They should be in the top two. They need to get their hands on silverware. Um, you'd imagine they'd be hurting as well from the way they lost the Leinster final last year. Um. You know, to be honest, you 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 would have to question the character a small bit and the resolve from like it, it was like the wave the white flag in the second half against Limerick the last day and that and that was really disappointing and I'd say Henry was left scratching his head. I personally thought that he cut the sort of figure where it was like I don't know if I can do much more with this group. That's just what I thought looking at it. He obviously does not think that at all. He thinks the exact opposite, clearly. He thinks he can get a lot more out of the group. So, yeah, but the, the first thing that they need to take off the off the list is getting their hands on Leinster title and stopping Kilkenny doing a five in a row. It's going to be interesting um, this year in the league. I think it was last year in uh, the league I met you when Galway played Cork. And around that time, Henry gave a scatter of young lads chances um, and that's what they went with in the league I think it was till the final game against Clare where they kind of went close to full strength but do you think he's going to do the same now again? Yeah I think that's what you have to do particularly under the current structure like they're not going to be relegated realistically yeah. Um, now it does the placings have a bearing on whether in 1A or 1B in 2025 in this new re- re- revamped league but like he has to see new faces like he knows he knows what he's going to get from Dottie Burke. He knows what he's going to get from the, the Thomas's contingent, who, regardless of how they get on at the weekend, will come in late enough again, I'd imagine, around game three or game four or something like that. Um, 
you know, he, he, like we have to see new faces. And the only way you're going to learn about whether they're, they're going to survive is to play them, you know, in you know top class kind of league games and find out whether they survive. Where eyes are on you, um, and I think that's what he's going to have to do as well. Um, like you, they're, they're they're always going to be safe in the league, so you have that kind of buffer where you can try new faces. And I think he has to, he has to unearth new names. He just has to. It's. It's a big challenge in one sense. I know it's the same for a lot of counties, but a lot of those young players he's given chances to. Because even I was looking there when you uh, published the Fitzgibbon squads, and I was looking at the young lads then in the Galway. Like you have predominantly nearly all the young fellas who are in this Galway squad are going to be playing Fitz. Yeah, very very tricky one. Obviously, um, like I remember, was it last year or the year before? The likes of would say Don Lachey would have had a, a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic on his legs. Yeah. Um, his dad is obviously involved this year, which is going to be that's going to be an interesting um, facet to it as well because Eamon O'Shea as a coach would be, um, how would you describe him? Uh, he'd be seen as quite out there. Do you know what I mean? He'd be very, he'd be very free flowing, natural play as you see. Whereas like and Henry would have been more kind of traditional, shall we say, when Tipperary beat. Limerick in 10, Tipperary were playing a style that was probably unfamiliar with Kilkenny. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how their styles kind of merge and throwing Richie O'Neill into the middle of it as well. And obviously the, the rest of the coaching team. So that's going to be fascinating. But Henry is, I think it's 80 Galway players um, across all of the Fitzgibbon squads. And there's going to be a large cohort of them on the Galway squad. So he's probably got a headache that I would say maybe only Pat Ryan and Cork has. Similar type of headache where you're looking at like up to a third of your squad are probably playing for Skibbon, maybe maybe more. He could have the guts of a half playing for Skibbon. So that's very, very tricky. Um I place a good bit of stock in Fitzgibbon Cup games, I have to say now. And if a fella is is thriving um at college level, it's a fair indicator that he's potentially going to thrive at county level. But there's nothing like your Tinder County manager wants to see them in their squad, in their jersey, playing their matches and whether they perform. So I know he spoke about it last year and he actually referenced that no county had it maybe as, as difficult as them. And that's going to be some, another thing that they're going to have to have to neg- uh, navigate in the early parts of... Uh, it's probably only going to overlap a couple of league games, maybe, I'd say. You just referenced Aidan O'Shea there and there's a lot of intrigue around the county at the minute, obviously. A highly regarded coach to come into the setup. But like, what's the one thing you feel he's going to bring to go with? Um, well, like if you look back at, would say Tipperary, like the likes of would say Bubbles of the Wire would have been very complimentary of him. Seamus Callum would have been very complimentary of him. Like he basically told Callum when he came in, like you're taking the freeze, you're going to be my man now. And it'll be interesting to see who he kind of nearly takes under his wing within Galway as well. What players? Maybe would think about someone like a Connor Cooney, maybe who was given a lot, a good bit of responsibility the last two years under Henry. Um, one of the best club players in the county, if not the country. Has he soared anything like the heights of 2017, realistically, in the last couple of years at county level? Probably not. We've seen glimpses here and there. Would someone like that thrive under him? Um, he'll it'll be a couple, it'll be forwards really that you're going to see, hopefully, maybe an Evan Island, maybe a Brian Concannon, that there'll be a, this kind of killer edge to them, and that this side will come in and you know instill a hell of a lot of belief in them that they can perform at the highest level and you know be dictators of games realistically because that's what he turned Callan that's what he helped turn Callan into like when he came in in he came in a like Callan was hurler the or nominated for hurler the year two of the years O'Shea was there and it, the year after he left as well when they won the All Ireland under Michael Ryan and got it then in 19, but he transformed his game and helped for perform or transform his mentality, I would say, as well. So mentally, I'd say he'd be getting inside a lot of lads' heads, uh, particularly the Gal- Galway attack. Like, look at him on paper. Put the Galway attack down on paper. And you're thinking, these boys could cause all sorts of damage for the cream of the crop, the Limericks, whoever it is. It just hasn't been on a consistent enough basis in the last couple of years. Um, and that consistency, I'd say, is something that Henry is craving going into 2024. Because any team he was ever involved in, they were always consistent. And you knew what you were going to get out of them on a given day. And unfortunately, at the minute with Galway, on a given day, they can be outstanding. 
within that same day, they can throw in a half an hour of, you know, that the half an hour, the last half an hour that all Ireland semi final was as bad as I've seen a team be in a marquee yeah. game like that, albeit playing against, you know, the best team in the country. Um, so they will be craving that consistency going into next year. Yeah, obviously Limerick are number one, and everyone everyone knows that at the minute, and it's up to everyone to try and hunt them down for twenty twenty four. But where do you think go with air in the pack? Oh, it's a difficult one. Um, see, like if they were all playing, just say, like the the round robins were, it was Limerick, Galway, Kilkenny, Cork. Just say the round robins were, you know, mixed between Leinster and Munster. You're thinking. It could be could be tricky for Kilkenny to get out of Munster. It is going to be difficult, or it's going to be difficult for Galway to get out of Munster if they're playing Cork and Limerick or whatever. But they do have they're going to be in an All Ireland quarter final, real realistically. So they're they're high up in the pack. There's great potential for them to be in an All Ireland semi final, which they have been in for the last two years. Um, and even going back to 2020, they were in it as well. So like they're not a million miles off and they've shown glimpses and more than glimpses in certain games that they can trouble, you know, the best team in the country. It's just, I don't know, a lot of, there would have been some question marks maybe about whether they were physically able to stand up to Limerick last year. I, I don't know. I always think that's an easy out when a team gets a run in here or whatever, you know, you look at how well conditioned or not that they are, but like Lucas Curzonstein that was with them would have been widely regarded as the best in the best in the game the best in the game or one of the best in the game. So I don't know if I'd be looking in that direction. But they're close. They're not like you could throw a blanket over Clare, uh, Kilkenny, Galway, Cork, Tip. You know, there's there's very little to choose between them all. But Galway, along with Kilkenny in particular, do have the added advantage of not being smart. The, pro- the province that they're playing in is like. What's the biggest? What's the biggest obstacle to Limerick winning the All Ireland next year? Not getting out of Munster, which nearly didn't happen this year. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas Kilkenny and Galway don't really have to worry about that. Just there, you mentioned two All Ireland semi finals. They've got to. Do you think there's an expectation now to get to a final, given that you've lost the last two semis? The manner of which they lost the semi final this year. Not not so much an expectation of getting to a final. I think there's an expectation that they win Leinster. And I think that really is a non-negotiable going into 2024. It gives you a path through to a semi-final. It also means if Limerick win Munster, you're not playing them in an all Ireland semi-final. Yeah. And that's what, like, what greater carrot could you have? Um, I think to me, that's the expectation. And it's the same chatting Adrian Rowan of Kilkenny last year. He said, what's Kilkenny's best chance of winning the All-Ireland? Um avoid Limerick until the last possible chance and maybe hope that somebody else has beaten them along the way. And that's, Galway probably in the same boat as well. Will Leinster be on the opposite side of the draw to Limerick if you have to play them in an Ireland final? All bets are off in the final. But you have to do, you need to do your part. You need to win Leinster and take care of your business and give yourself the best chance of getting to a final. And listen, if they if they were to win Leinster, would it? Would I think they'd be in the All Ireland final? Yeah, probably would. Yeah, if they're if they're if they're good enough to win Leinster and to have that little confidence boost of winning, getting silverware under their belt, and even avoiding Limerick. Yeah, there's a fair chance of them getting to an Ireland semi final. But um, a good bit of water under the bridge to there's not, a lot of water needs to go under the bridge before that could happen. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the county season will be here again before we know it. But that's all uh, we do have time for on today's show. Uh, thanks a million to Michael for coming on. No bother, Paul. Thanks.